Pardon? 1 p.m.? Uh, two, yeah, 2 p.m., yeah, yeah. Is this working? This is working. Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, on behalf of the School of Visual Arts, uh, welcome. I'm Suzanne Anker. I am chair of the Fine Arts Department here. And this is our building, which you're welcome to walk around later if you'd like, with every new technology you can think about, as well as a bio art laboratory. Um, I'm very grateful to Jay Wook Lee for bringing and organizing this symposium to my attention because SBA has a long history of working with Korean students and even as such as having an SBA alumni association in Korea itself. So I just want to say a couple of words about this new geography that we are embarking on because uh, the global world is all connected now or mostly connected and zeros and ones have become the new lingua franca. Um, so that is creating pixelated images, it's creating remote sensors and like Martian McLuhan talked about, the world is shrinking. Uh, but what this is doing as well is erasing global difference and calling into question very strict nationalist concepts. So if we look at identity politics of the 80s, it has morphed into the politics of identity. And one of the aims of this conference is to transfer those agencies of connection into the social order and into the flesh and blood so people can meet, exchange ideas, and interrupt the status quo. Now, Korea, as you all know, has been in the press, both nationally and internationally, in recent months. In fact, yesterday, Kim Jong-un attended a concert in South Korea, and he's the first North Korean leader to set foot in South Korea since the end of the Korean War. And um, he will meet with Moon Jae-in on April 27th to talk about, or at least thaw the ice between those North and South in the Korean Peninsula. So I think this is very important kind of meeting, as well as the meeting with our president, or the suggested meeting with our president, with Kim Jong-un, and I hope he doesn't insult him too much at that meeting. Um, but 
I think that these are elements of, of at least hope in terms of discussion. Now, Korean art, for me, has been very complicated. I used to teach the World Art Survey here for many years, and using Marilyn Stokestead's book, which now sort of turned Western art history into a global dimension, there were like three pages in that book at that time dedicated to Korean art. And my students would come up to me and say, what is going on here? And I think that this is an indication of really Korea taking its place on the international stage, which it has been doing for the last decade or more. And so um, let's begin our conference, okay? Jay Wa. <laughs> uh, hello, uh, my name is Jae Lee, and thank you for coming. Um, I'm a faculty member here at SVA and um, I'm founder and director of the, this symposium, Mind for Joint, 2008. Um, first, I'm, uh, thank you, Suzanne Anker and uh, BFA Fine Arts at SVA for having us, and thank you, uh, NYU and um, uh, Professor Yi yong -woo and um, Kim sung hwan uh, We had a, another great session last day at NYU. Uh, all right, as an artist, I have uh, actively engaged in art scenes both in the United States and South Korea for the last eight years. I've, I've seen interesting conversations and critical discourses around contemporary art in both places. I think they can be shared and interrelated. But it's, I've seen a significant lack of conversations between these two countries or between these two art scenes. Uh, even though there are similarities and potential crossovers between two countries to, to, uh, or two cultures, they're looking at, I think, kind of two different directions. Uh, for example, scholars and curators in New York City might feel they have nothing to do with Korean or, my, uh, or simply they've never thought about contemporary Korean art or artists. And likewise, on the other side. So I, I kind of wanted to turn these two you know, uh, arrows like inward so potentially they will be, you know, crossed in the future. So um, I invited contemporary Korean art artists, from, uh, artists and curators and writers from South Korea. Also, I invited an artist, a curator, and writer in the United States who, know, who may know a little about contemporary Korean art, but they can be well matched. So in other words, this uh, conversation series try to assimilate practices of Korean artists and conversations uh, that are taking place around the world, uh, including here in New York City, by matching professionals in the U.S. whose practices share similar interests. Mind of Joint 2018 offers a meeting point where similar yet different ideas gather together and open new ideas. So I urge uh, our participant here uh, today not only show their own work, but try to communicate with each other and find meaningful connections. Um, the condition of true communication, I believe, are mutual respect and trust. So I, I hope uh, we'll have a kind of new meaningful conversation today. All right, let me uh, introduce Taeyong Park. He's a curator. He's going to present, uh, introduce uh, Mind of Joint 2018 today. Thank you. Hello, thanks for coming this afternoon. Uh, since we have so many to tell you this afternoon, I will try to have my presentation very short. I'm setting the alarm. Uh, if the alarm sound comes, it's 8 minutes 30 seconds, and then I will try to wrap up my presentation. Okay, here we go. Um, so, does it work? Can we go back to the previous slide? So um, this is a quick presentation of who I am and how it is in Korea and where I am standing. 
And I think personally, Korea is the future of the world in a way, in a negative way. But I think, uh, I hope there is an another opportunity to discuss, discuss about this. And next slide, please. So this is what happened just a few days ago in Pyongyang, North Korea. Uh, next slide. You see the familiar face, uh, the rocket man that Suzanne Anker mentioned. Why uh, I'm showing this? Next slide. Uh, that's what's happened just about a year ago. Uh, we sent our you know, president to jail. You can you know, do this. And we did once again, like just a month ago, like another president going to jail. You can also do this. And next slide, please. So uh, what I'm trying to say is that in Korea, uh, generally things are larger than life. So it is very difficult for artists or creators to do whatever because reality is sometimes really overwhelming and really larger than life. Uh, next slide, please. So I got into the college in 2002, and this is the summer 2002 around the city center. Let's say this is the Times Square of New York, like in a way. Next slide, please. But just a few months you know, earlier, this is also like near the same place in front of my university. I, I just got into the college and this was what was happening. Next slide, please. So, I, again, very different things are happening at the same time in Korea. And this is 2008, 2009 candlelight uh, protest against uh, one of the former president that's, who's now in the jail. And it looks similar like the cheering crowd of the World Cup games, but actually this time it was for the protest. And at the time, the protest just failed, like maybe what you guys are feeling in the US now. Uh, next slide, please. So again, let's say this uh, was the Times Square of New York or somewhere very important in Washington, and the president literally put the container boxes in, you know, in the middle of the big road to block the citizens to peacefully march to the presidential residence. I regard it as um, if somebody did it as part of the biennial, it could have made a big you know, conceptual art prize, I think. But it was not art. It was part of our everyday reality in Korea. And again, all these previous images, everything was happening within the four kilometers radius, and that's where the museums and important art institutions were located, and I, I worked for one of the art institutions at the very center of those places for two years. Next slide, please. So here I uh, want to mention my f one of my favorite concepts by one of my favorite German Marxist philosophers, who's Ernst Bloch, the concept of non-simultaneity, where a group or the society going into a very rapid changes and different parts of the society has different timelines and different sense of time and different changes. Next slide, please. And around the time of the candlelight protest, I started working in the arts. That was in 2009. And the reason why I joined this a humongous exhibition with over 100 artists at, taking place at the former military site was because maybe I was feeling so tired of failing in the political dimension. It was really huge lethargy that I had in my mind and heart and everything. Uh, and this was the first project that I was part of as a coordinator and an assistant. Next slide, please. And in the following year, I joined uh, another very big project. It, this is uh, a biennial that takes place at the Seoul Museum of Art. Uh, this time I was promoted to a project manager and I worked day and night, like 8 to 10, 8 to 11, and I was thinking that that's kind of a normal thing for art worker, which turned out to be not true. Uh, next slide, please. So after these two years, I was starting to thinking about the institutional sense of time and institutional practice in Korea, and I was very unhappy about the institutional practice at the time. Next slide, please. So um, in 2011, this was my first independent project. Actually, you can 
uh, visit the website to see the details of the project, but I will not mention it uh, today. But what I was trying to do was that everything that I saw as not being done by the institutions, which has to be done by the institutions. Next slide, please. So I was developing an idea of making a pseudo institution. Next slide, please. Uh, maybe a smaller organization, maybe a project that's doing what institutions should do in a smaller scale, leaving uh, examples or cases to be followed or taken by other institutions or people. So uh, between 2012 and 2016, I uh, formed a curatorial collective called Work on Work with my colleague He Jin Zhang. You can also visit the website to see what we have done so far. Next slide, please. But at the same time, I was uh, being invited by the institutions. So I was being institutionalized once again between 2013 and 17. So I worked for and at these institutions and also other institutions in Korea, uh, in the UK, and in Germany. But I was, again, I thought that, oh, now I have a, a proper position and I have a budget. For example, uh, this last project that I have done, the budget was three million US dollars, which is not a small money. But the thing was that the actual time that we were given to work on this thing was six months. So like, what, what could I do possibly? I mean, we spent the money well, but we were not given time because that was uh, how time and administration process functions in Korea. So now that I was in the institutions once again, but I could not actually control the time because that's beyond my reach and that's how the whole system works and one individual cannot actually change the flow of time. Uh, next slide, please. So now that I decided that rather than uh, simulating an institution, rather I become an institution. Next slide, please. Maybe a para-institution, parasiting on existing institutions. Next slide, please. So um, a little bit of advertisement. If you visit seoul.readingroom.me, uh, this is seoul.readingroom.me because it can be tokyo.readingroom.me or New York.readingroom.me. So I decided to establish an institution. I mean, on paper, it is an institution. So I can approach the institutions, not as Jae Yong Park as an independent curator, but as an institution that's called Seoul Reading Room. And this will not only be me, but with my colleagues who want to overcome the limitation of very short amount of time that's been given to all the artists and curators basically in Korea. So actually, uh, there was some result. I have one minute, 30 seconds. So uh, I am doing a project called Post Reality with the Korea National University of Arts and Korea National Information Agency. They um, proposed me that they have some money to do some small project, maybe uh, on exhibition, and then I proposed them back that, no, I want to do it for three years. You guys provide me uh, with money for one year, but I will tell the world that this is the first phase of my three-year uh, research. Next slide, please. So uh, please join my <laughs> newsletter <laughs> so that you can get updates on my um, upcoming projects. But anyway, um, all these, uh, my nine years of practice, I've been realizing like, on happy with the institution, Pseudo, uh, uh, pseudo institution within the institution once again and deciding to be a para institution. I think this is in a way uh, uh, overcome the limitations that we see in Korea. And I think I will also discuss a little bit of issue of time and temporality in our session with Hichon and Ayla at 3 p.m. So this was uh, Jae Yong Park. And I expect everyone in this room to be joining the newsletter. And this is the end of presentation. Thank you very much. So I guess I have seven minutes left. <laughs> so. Um, 
while the presentation opened. Yeah, please. A first page. Okay. Can you make it bigger? Yeah. Okay, I'll just start. Yeah. There are times when particular things uh, demand interest and, and then even force you to continue to give attention issues, uh, whether you are interested in it or not. So today I'd like to share some of the projects that was required to me to do this. When you were asked some questions that even uh, every corner that you go around, maybe it is a time that you really think about why, what is the problem, where is that comes from. So I faced on it, said so this is the kind of evidence of the uh, problems and it is the face of the, all the problems where it comes from. This is where I work and then have a, having an exhibition and a workshop every day. It is a quite unlikely with the white cube. It was built in 1942 and then running, till, running a motel till the 2004. So the original plan was actually it should be demolished and then build a new building for a gallery. But they found out that it has a lot of uh, background history. It is a start on and uh, Korean modern literature just started and then there at the time poor noblesse and a poetess that borrowed these rooms and then using their own studio. So we decided to not gonna demolish it and then but don't know how, how we gonna restoration or preserve it or just follow the original plan. But we just are holding it at a time, just stop the construction. Then it's been uh, 10 years that we haven't actually started <laughs> Uh, decide yet. So next slide. So we just have another idea that maybe we can just preserve the original building, then then build a new other, uh, the more functional and a modernized building that are connected to each other. So this is a kind of a good story about the how the uh, we can reserve and preserve the disappeared scannery and the unrecorded memory. So that's the what I faced on it then these days, and, and I have no idea of this, uh, the early 1920s or 30s architectures or the other memories, but still you've got the uh, questioning about uh, why, why is that comes from, and then these days a lot of uh, young Korean artists actually dealing with in everyday life in their, around the towns. So next slide. So this is also another project space that I work with and then I didn't actually like uh, purposely work in this kind of project space but I just wanted to be my like curatorial uh, ship and I'm making my own exhibition but this based on this like having an exhibition in this kind of project space and then you have to dealing with it and how we gonna uh, do it with this with this and then um, memories and an unrecorded uh, scannery. So there we have another lot of public project and a young artist exhibition that we uh, invited. Next. Yeah, this is the street that the outside of the project space and then it quite, uh, now it, you can't see this kind of scannery. It's very actually disappeared in the last uh, 10 years. So next one. So Next one as well. So we just invited uh, national or international artists and then uh, taking a residency and then have a research with the sound trips or the uh, filming around the town. So making another uh, video clips. And then next one. Yeah, that's kind of so next. Can you just, yeah. So this is another yeah, public space public program with the uh, residents and then share the memories and then uh, how it's coming from and how it's begun to the redevelopment and so on. So next one, yes, yeah, please just keep, yes, yes. Yeah. So there is also a lot of architecture of Biennale in the Seoul these days and then this is one of the, my project with another artist. Uh, the next one, please. So it's actually in a Korean, that is, means that you, that actually you can make with, can you make it go further? Next one, please. 
yeah, you can actually making this essential light to with the very small mirrors and then projecting this uh, very poetic mirrors. So we have uh, this kind of uh, better plans for the the last decade and then every like disappeared architectures and then scannery that's begun to that our dealings dealing with that we have to protect this. So uh, I think the art uh, we can make it, is we can make it transcendent uh, about the whole the legacy of what we have. But instead of the standing one side, art plays a role in illuminating the phenomena of society that they be carefully to falling into the ethical, political extremes. So uh, I think the art should transcend us the dichotomy of a black and white logic of articulating the concepts that are thought to be in a conflict. If it's not, the old frame in the conflict with continue to be required to the new generation to come. So I think the mind for joint also have some similar notions that the we, what we are going to do in this course. So I'm lending this yeah, speech with my, just reading a short poem with a Korean contemporary uh, poem because it is something that uh, you have um, some interest or not, then you also have required some of kind of uh, questioning. And then it is actually not coming from uh, what you interested at first, but the work so it might find you, not you find the work at first. So next one, the, yeah, go back. To, so I'm just re yeah, reading this poem. So that is never ending song. Is it not over yet? I thought it was over. When does it this song end? Is it not over ending song? If I knew it, I wouldn't have a request it. I didn't request it. Really, who is that person? Who am I the only one listening to it? I'm so sick and tired of it, and I wanted to listen to other songs. Would I be able to listen to it if I wait? I really wanted to listen to it from here. I must. I can't go elsewhere. I don't have much time left. Please stop this song. Damn it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jeong Park and Kohun Sung, for, for your wonderful presentations. Uh, for, for the next one hour, we're, uh, we're going to have artist Won Jun Che and curator Xia Yu Wen. Uh, let me introduce briefly. Uh, Won Jun Che is, is an artist and filmmaker in South Korea uh, who focuses on North Korean sculpture or architecture in Africa. Won Jun Che traveled Africa countries to find North Korean statues, like a North Korean uh, a statues made by North Korean. That is because since the Korean War, African countries and North Korea have had very close diplomatic relationship, and so North African countries has actually hired a lot of North Korean artists to build gigantic statues and building for their leaders. So uh, Won Jun Che's uh, kind of interest in this, how uh, place uh, uh, the geopolitical issue between North Korea and, 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 and Africa in a kind of, for us, the unexpected way. And also, Xia Yeo Wen uh, is the associate curator uh, of the Guggenheim Museum. She uh, curated one, one and a half years ago uh, called Tales of Our Time, uh, which for me is, is about uh, places, how places, uh, the meaning of places uh, have changed over time based on social political conditions and how, how artists responded to these uh, the, 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 the places in influx. So uh, I feel even though they're kind of different, uh, they focus is, is uh, kind of different because Chai Yuen was focusing on Chinese, uh, Chinese and China, Won Jun Che was focused on North Korea and Africa, but I, I kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, a strong similarity between the two, so for me it's, it would be uh, exciting to see uh, their presentation and how they 
uh, connect them uh, together. All right, let's welcome Won Jun Chae. Hi, hi. Hi, hello. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, I made it uh, 30 lengths, uh, 28 mini lengths, but uh, I don't have much time. So can you can you play uh, from seven minutes? Yeah, yeah I think it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, I'm sorry, five minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, before starting, um, yeah, just play, just yeah. Uh, yeah, before starting art, uh, I served as a um, as a military as, a, as an evidence collector. You know? oh. um, my main mission was uh, uh, collecting illegal protest portrayed on the street uh, when they. Um, when they carry the illegal weapon like a steel pipe or uh, some, <laughs> yeah. some, some, uh, yeah, some wooden stick, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I didn't study art, so that was my starting point to be an artist, and uh, yeah, I, I was, I was curious why peop many people uh, demonstrate on the street and. I naturally um, interested in social political issues, and uh, yeah, this is a uh, uh, this film is about torture and uh, I mean history of torture. Uh, some history and uh, offered me to collaborate. Um, I mean to make exhibition, and uh, it was like a collaboration with the historian and. Uh, I lot some. I, I read them. I read a book about uh, torture, history of torture, and uh, from from Japanese uh, colonial era to uh, Park Jong uh, who is a dictator in South Korea in his era. And uh, yeah, uh, and the, I made the. I uh, I felt like a um, indirect trauma after reading a book, and uh, I decided to make. Uh, this film and combined with the uh, old um, film uh, that uh, relates to Korean um, intelligence center, uh, KCIA, yeah, Korean Intelligence Center. So yeah, this is a film about this, and uh, yeah. Can you please volume up? Yeah. yeah.
journalist is about uh, Korean, the first Korean curator uh, in Paris. And he uh, translated Korean uh, traditional song opera uh, to a French opera. And, uh, um, he, he's, a, he's, a, he's a curator, but the, uh, he's well known as a, a assassin because he killed a, son, a betrayer uh, who was supported uh, by, uh, who wanted to live on South Korea and Korea, uh, supported by Japan, Japan government, Japanese government. So this is, this is the story. This is the, the this film based on the story. This is the book uh, that I found in Paris. Uh, his friend, uh, um, his friend, uh, painter. Um, I forgot his name. Sorry. Uh, anyway, he he knows about uh, Hong Jong-woo, who is the yeah, curator at uh, Kimé Museum. Yeah, when uh, his friends uh, first met uh, Hong Jong-woo, and uh, it's it's uh, it's like a yeah, essay. And he killed uh, this uh, uh, progressive party leader, Kim ok -kyun. So, yeah, people don't know much about his uh, curator uh, practice or his, uh, yeah, curatorship. And uh, this is uh, yeah, my recent project. Yeah, one of the series uh, about the relationship between Africa and North Korea. And uh, the statue is uh, the Unkomo, he called Unkomo statue, who is the former vice president of Zimbabwe. And uh, he was a liber of uh, Mugabe. Um, and North Korea fully supported Mugabe, and uh, Mugabe, um, he, he wanted to uh, like wiping out uh, the, the... It's not the national army. That's my plane here. And, 
it is the 5th Brigade. And the 5th Brigade says itself, it is not a government organ, it is a party organ. But this North killing Korean, thing, uh, military I couldn't possibly the, keep quiet. Uh, couldn't force possibly. And they, uh, killed, uh, they killed more so than 200,000 people in Bulawayo city, uh, where uh, his hometown I that in Zimbabwe. Was, uh, North Korean statue, I was devastated. I didn't imagine that uh, so our own uh, people, Bulawayo people uh, our own uh, government, could removed, once more engage uh, the North Ukumo's Koreans to statue do something because like that been made if by they North really Korean wanted to honor my father that way. I think uh, a Zimbabwean could have done that. There, there's a lot of artists here in Zimbabwe that could have easily done that for us. If we can't do it, they're they are friends uh, in, our, in neighboring countries who can do that for us. Of all the people, North Koreans, I don't think they qualified at all to, to construct a, a statue for us. I think that's, that's an insult more than anything. Zimbabwe에서는 오여단이라고 그러고 북한에서는 폭풍 여단이라고 그러는데 짐바브웨가 역사적으로 잔우, 자푸라고 하는 하나는 뭐 인민해방전선, 민족해방전선 두 파가 갈라져 싸웠거든요. 무가베가 정권을 잡으면서 첫 번째 한 일이 평양에 가서 김일성 주석한테 친위대를 만들어 달라. 그래서 그 친위대가 반대파를 쓸어 버린 거거든요. 무력으로. I think the, the, the biggest problem we actually have is not only to deal with the North Koreans of, because they trained the Kukurandi uh, army and they were really part and parcel of the government then to actually deal with this issue and bring all these atrocities. I think my main worry is for as long as our current government, which is led by our current president, Robert Mkare, has not faced this and dealt with it, and actually sat down with the people of Matebelele to actually work this thing out. I think we will never ever have any good relationships with the Koreans because if I can give you a classical example, there is a statue, the Joshua Nkomo one, and Joshua Nkomo is uh, the one who was the leader of the Zapu, uh, of the Zapu political party, which fought hand in hand with the party that actually fought against colonialism. So soon after independence, the main thing that Joshua Nkomo's people were attacked, which were the predominantly the Ndebele people. So everything, the history came away from there. Can you imagine? And the very same people make that particular sculpture. given a mission to go to uh, Korea, is DPRK. Uh, I went into military training. Uh, that's the basic uh, guerrilla uh, warfare training. We started on a, you know, individual, more like a karate training for individual uh, protection and things to that effect. Unfortunately, I never had any uh, like a personal uh, you know, uh, interaction thereafter. Uh, with uh, you know uh, North Koreans, uh, but my, my my feeling, I mean, it's, my, my memories of uh, North Korea is uh, like a, a, it was a real eye opener and a real tough. Young Nimurobuto, Mulgun Tongo, Padan Doginan, Zimbabwe, Mugabe, De Tungyangan, Sagidere Tunginan. 위대한 김일성 동지께서 이끌어 주시어 이롭겠다고 말했고 이내 스쿠투르의 대통령도 김일성 동지는 상세계 인민들의 수령이시였다고 했습니다.
I think the time is over, and I hope we can talk more uh, after the talk. <laughs> Korea people is a people, it's the Italian people. Korea people is vigilant, and the Korea people is very fast, very fast. And they tell you the truth. Uh, interesting is that uh, many uh, African people that I met uh, don't know differences between South and North, and uh, North and South Korea. So Since people there I try to explain, uh, but I still, yeah. I try to uh, explain, try to explain. I, I'm from South Korea, but they don't understand uh, where the South because they thought uh, Africa is one country. That is North Korea. They are following us. It means this is our people, this is our brother, this is our sister, and they, they need really to help us. That's why we are never to forget you people. And uh, the, uh, the Memorial Museum in Namibia is very similar to uh, North Korean Revolutionary uh, Memorial. Yeah. So uh, it's, it's kind of copy and uh, it's not related to African culture or uh, any or hi uh, historical aesthetic. So, um, North, when, after North Korea uh, uh, built many uh, buildings and monuments for free of charge, and they also recorded the, this uh, film uh, uh, for their propaganda to, to promote their uh, regime. And, uh, yeah, this, <coughs> I found this film in Canada. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and North Korean people thought uh, Kim Il Sung he was very uh, like uh, generously uh, supported uh, poor African people in the sixties, seventies, and eighties. And this is uh, my uh, new project. I, I, uh, I'm I almost finished uh, this project. Uh, it's about North, uh, the daughter, uh, the woman uh, named Monica, who is the daughter of the first president of Equatorial Guinea. Um, she grew up in North Korea for 15 years as a stepdaughter of uh, Kim Il-sung, uh, the first uh, president of North Korea. So in the, this is a theatrical uh, documentary uh, combined with the, uh, my imagination a little bit. Yeah. Can you volume up? Por qué no me hablaste en español? Es verdad que ella no me entiende nada. Yo solo quería que me dijeras que me quisieras. She is the Monica. Uh, Solo quería que me dijeras que me querías. She published the biography in 2014 and I met her in London. Uh, my initial uh, idea was uh, making documentary film, but uh, I thought um, her life is very theatrical. So, yeah, I made this kind of, uh, I created this form.
old story based on her biography, but uh, and the, the characters uh, on the film from uh, her uh, memory, except uh, one uh, actress. Ostdeutschland ist das Land der Arbeiter und der Bauern. Das beste Land auf der ganzen Welt. Wenn ich die Westdeutschen sehe, wirken die irgendwie jämmerlich. Wie schön wäre es, wenn wir bald wieder vereint werden und auch die Westdeutschen, wie wir Kommunisten leben. Monika, Igopa, Ige Udi Naraya. Arm Dabzi, Onjega Nodo Hamman Guck Udi Naraya in Dulloa. Monika's 눈을 볼때 가끔 그의 눈 속에서 조선인을 볼 때가 있었어요. 모니카는 확인하고 싶었던 것 같아요. 자신이 서 있는 곳이 어딘지. The Monica doesn't want to be black. She saw uh, she's Asian. She told me like that. So actually, it's not about North Korean um, or North Korean politics or diplomatic relationship between Africa and North Korea. It's about uh, identity. Donde estoy ahora? Podré ir a casa? Thank you. Sorry, you went. Do you know if I can control with this? Yeah. Hmm? Okay. Yeah. Um, thank you for inviting I guess maybe I'm a little bit of a odd because I don't, I'm not going to speak about Korea or anything. Um, and um, as Jay uh, Wook mentioned earlier, I did an exhibition at the Guggenheim about a year and a half ago. It's called Tales of Our Time. but. I'm not really going to talk about this show because I think many of you might have seen it. Um, maybe it's more interesting to hear a little bit more about my upcoming show that opens in about a month at the Guggenheim. Um, next slide. Oh, sorry. Oh, maybe I'll just control it myself. Yeah. So my next exhibition is called One Hand Clapping. Um, I'm using a book cover to show you the title. Um, before I get into the details of the artwork, maybe I was just commenting a little bit about uh, the ideas of why the show is named as such and why I'm interested in um, some of the issues. I think maybe one thing I could contribute for today's conference is really to think about the relationship of local and global and how that has evolved in the years um, and how the discourses and arguments are changing um, and how we actually adapt into it. 
uh, for me, maybe I'll link a little bit for the first show, which is Tales of Our Time. Like Jay Wick introduced earlier, it is about uh, challenging our understanding of place, whether it's a geographic concept or some sort of abstract construct. Um, but that is also looking at ideas of globalization as, as a way of connecting different places, our mobility of traveling to different places. So it's pretty much an, an understanding from a spatial way of you know, uh, movement. And I think for one hand clapping, the exhibition really kind of shift the understanding of globalization from a spatial concept to a temporal one. Um, I think for me, it's interesting to think how connected we are right now uh, by all the telecommunications, internet, and all the digital way means of communication. It is a shift from um, kind of a synchronization of 24 seven as something that is um, a new layer of globalization. So this exhibition is pretty much about time and how we uh, navigate and negotiate with our relationship with the future. In particular, a single vision of the future that is based off economic growth and technological advancement, which is pretty much, again, a continuation of the Cold War mentality, even though we're kind of in a different era now, but the value still perpetuates. Um, and also for me to think about China, especially sensationalized by the politician and media in this country, in the United States, that is the biggest rival and this growing force, the rising power that is very scary and the kind of a monstrous uh, character. So in a way, China became uh, a synchron uh, um, synchronized with the concept of the future, but a future that is not so optimistic in a sense. Um, so, and then it comes to the title of the show, it's called One Hand Clapping. It doesn't really have a direct or way or didactic way to summarize everything I just said before. But I think this exhibition is also pretty much about how do you show artwork from an, a country and a very specific identity based kind of narrative in a place that might have different understanding or projection on this of what this culture is. So I'm not sure how familiar you are with this phrase, one hand clapping. It actually came from a Zen practice originated in Tang Dynasty, China, so around six, seven hundreds. Um, and it's about um, a series of questions seemingly uh, paradoxical and contradiction, contradictory um, and doesn't have immediate clear answers. But the practice is to challenge the limitation of rational thinking, which is pretty much a Western way of uh, negotiating with reality. So this phrase is made popular actually by Salinger's book, who is an American writer, um, his book called Nine Stories. And the phrase was referenced as, as the epigraph in the book. And it's commonly translated from Japanese actually. If you, we all know the sound of two hands clapping, but what is the sound of one hand clapping? So on the surface, this is a question I have no answer because one hand clapping is very bizarre and strange. But on the other hand, if you really start to think about it, actually uh, all sorts of image start to emerge. One of them is this idea of solidarity, a lone hand trying to make a sound. And for me, I think this is also the position of a lot of artists working today. Um, you're working alone in a way um, and trying to contest and, and uh, negotiate with establish the power structures and stereotypes, and etc. Um, but then also, uh, one hand clapping now become a cultural cliche because it is made popular by the beat generation, specifically in the United States, where was this new agey influence of you know, Zen thinking and practice. It, then it was referenced by other writers, and then it became a name of a band, a British band. Then it was a title of a film, Australian film. Um, we thought it was super funny because the title then circled back to China, uh, Hong Kong, specifically in the 90s, and it was used by George Lim, a very famous Canton pop singer, to name, a band, name his album published in the 90s. Then we're borrowing again to name this show. So it's also this kind of a play of how meaning is being circulated, omitted, retranslated, and restated in the globalized world with all these misinterpretations. Um, so that's one hand clapping. 
Um, and then, again, a, as I mentioned earlier, the exhibition look at sort of ideas of the future, also this one vision of the future that is specifically based off technological advancement. And this is not something new because, like I said, it's a men uh, mentality of the Cold War. So these posters are actually from late 50s, early 60s China, where it was the Great Leap Forward movement, a uh, nationwide policy imposed by the Communist Party to accelerate production and industrialization of China, which lead to a disastrous result for three years uh, farming. A lot of millions of people died. Uh, but the, the poster is really interesting to actually read. And this one specifically features steel production. And at the time, the popul population was encouraged to make steels in their backyard by recycling the pots and pans. But of course, the product is very low quality. It's not even usable and applicable. Uh, applicable. Thus, the disaster later. Um, so I kind of just want to introduce that layer of historical reference as how our obsession with you know, advancement and technological kind of automation um, and working with machines. Um, and then, of course, we have different layers of kind of understanding of these te technological advancements today as um, the relationship between the body of the workers with uh, products like Apple and, and all these things that are assembled in China, specifically Foxconn, which is a Taiwanese company. Um, and then we have Sophie, um, who is the first robot, uh, artificial intelligence, that acquired a citizenship. Um, so these are just kind of the reference um, materials for leading towards the exhibition. And then I'm going to talk about specifically the artworks. And this exhibition is a purely new commission-based project. So we didn't know what the artist was going to produce. We provide the artist with a set of keywords, as I did for Tales of Our Time. And this time, we have 15 keywords. And some has to do with technology, future, utopia, um, humanity, ghost uh, mediums. That is broad enough, but also just pro provides a framework for the artist to respond. So Duan Jianyu is a painter based in China. And she did the two sets of work under sort of the bigger title of Spring River in the Flower Moon Night series. And that is a title from a Tang Dynasty poem. It's also being reappropriated many times in China to adapt into musicals, uh, dance, and uh, theaters, but also a way of showing nationalistic spirit of what it means to be real Chinese. So for her, um, she is very interested in sort of su such adaptation and how do you negotiate a culture with its, you know, its sense in a way. Um, and also for Duan, she is very interested in how modernity and, and kind of the process of globalization purged all the local aesthetic experience and something is considered beautiful or acceptable, or standardized in art world or in general, and something that is really bizarre and canny. And she is looking for these unique kind of aesthetic experience in the transitory territory where the urban meets the rural in China specifically. And this kind of long hair style is wearing by countryside women in China and it's still a very kind of a popular fetishizing way of showing beauty but at the same time is being, you know, um, considered as tacky in like an urban environment. So for her, these are some of the um, uh, figures or elements that she's interested in exploring. And then she's also interested in marginalized social figures. For example, this disabled homeless person. But for her, they're having a lot of fun themselves by creating these mechanism that provides mobility. And then she in incorporates a lot of classic motif, like the rabbits and the moon fairy that is often popular in Chinese kind of fairy tales. And then uh, also, you can see a very strong sense of humor in her work that is pretty much narrative based. And this pair of shoes for her is also like a, 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 a um, gadget for like a spy, for example. But instead of having cameras or gowns hiding them, she put these embroidery tools and threads and little scissors inside of it. Also give this imagination space for a countryside woman, no? rural woman and her every day. Um, and she's also making two sets of carrot sculpture. They're cast browns but they're having these human figures that will be also displayed in, in the museum. So the idea is really to look at the so-called um, kind of 
how do you say, uh, this aesthetic experience is that is not so much synchronized with the globalization process and also where do you position them and do you consider them ugly or beautiful or something else. Uh, and the next artist I'm going to talk about is Wang Ping. He is actually right now at the New Museum China New showing an animation piece if you haven't seen it. He's a pretty interesting artist working specifically with animation. And his new piece is called Dear Can I Give You Your Hand? So the background story, all his story actually came from everyday encounters and real stories uh, of, uh, of his everyday. So the starting point of this story is really for him to think about the Asian population in Hong Kong against the backdrop of digital economy. Because of the high price of real estate, people cannot usually find place to bury their dead um, ancestors or, or family members. Of course, you're getting crimin criminated, incriminated, right? Um, but even for that, finding a plot is very, very expensive. So now the government encourage really people to kind of spread their ashes in the sea. But then at the same time, there are also these surveys called online tomb sweeping. So you can create an online account, and then you log in every year, and then you provide digital products for your ancestors. Usually it's done in front of their tombstone and burn the paper, like a fake paper monies and all this. I think this also shared the pain Asian in a way for these uh, traditional kind of ceremonial um, way of commemorating your ancestor, but there's really like a real service that now you can do it online. So all these become kind of a reference for Wang Ping to think about the narrative of the story. And another important encounter was him, it's just a steal from the animation. Uh, another encounter of the, of the story is one day he was walking in the streets in Hong Kong and saw an old gentleman uh, discarding a bag of something into a recycle bin and he was very curious, so he followed him. After he departs, he opened the lid of the bin, and he found it's a, it's a bag of very well-packed pornography VHS tape, right? the Japanese pr pornography VHS tape. So that triggers his curiosity as why he discarded them, because his technology probably went obsolete, and, but why he packed them so nicely and his age. So he started to fantasize the story, and this is the beginning of this animation. But at the same time, the story gets very, uh, because all his work is also metaphorical and fable-like. So for him, he's envisioning himself as an 80, old, 80 years old man in the future, but this patriarchy figure for him is also tells a very complex relationship between the mainland Hong Kong and the British colonizer, right? So this father figure was the Brit British for a long time. Now it's shifting its power to the Chinese mainland. So he's really being a very kind of critical, but at the same time, ironic in outlining these different relationships. Um, and I'm putting some of just the, our catalog section to feature Wang Ping, and a lot of it is kind of in a diary, di diary uh, way of telling his observations of the everyday. Um, and then the next artist I'm showing is Ling Yi Ling, and he's making also an, an a uh, series of installation work called Molnad, which is a 17th century theory deve developed by this German polymer called Leibniz. And for by Molnad, he means that he thinks the whole universe is composed of single substance, and each substance is a monad, and they cannot be further uh, deconstructed, but the monad is in combination in a perfect order. He's also a theologist, so who, who the pers a very religious person. So he thinks this perfect order is imposed by the God. Um, so on the surface, it's a very outdated theory, but at the same time, Leibniz is the one who invented the algorithm. So basically the 1010 sequencing that we're very familiar today. And that is also from a misunderstanding and misinterpretation of I Ching, the Chinese book of cosmism. Um, and the the, 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 he received that book by a um, French pr uh, priest who were working in China at the time and sent him a copy of the book. So he read the book, mistranslated it, and misinterpreted it, and, and uh, landed to, to sort of the knowledge of what we have today. So I thought that was also a very interesting relationship. You can find these materials if you just Google. You can further read in how he you know, created all this.
But for Ling Yi Ling, he's also interested in sort of the VR technology and how that could create empathy uh, in a way. This is a film studio from Fassbinder's TV series called World on the Wire. Um, basically speculates that we are all living in a simulated reality. None of us are real. We're all like, um, I don't know, digital uh, programming. And then and the idea of monad for Ling is also to describe this perfect thing, right? The perfect substance. So he was interested in specifically the symbol of basketball and how it plays a role intersecting identity and cultural imagination in the United States. Um, and for him, the only Asian figure that is playing right now in the league is Jeremy Ling, this Taiwanese-American player who plays for Brooklyn Nets. And he really want to work with him to kind of stage this piece. So we managed to get in touch with Jeremy Ling, and we 3D scanned him and made a, a VR piece where I can describe to you the experience. So you enter the space, you put on the goggles, and then you start to realize your perspective become extremely low, so you're sitting on the ground. And then you see Jeremy sleep approaching you and picks you up and dabbling a few times and shoot you to, to the basket. So basically, you're being turned into a basketball. Um, and the idea, of course, is whimsical and funny, is to try to think if you can feel how a ball feels. Maybe it's not so difficult to feel how another person is feeling. Um, and then he also did two performance. This is a durational performance of him rolling against gravity from the lobby of the Guggenheim to the top, and also kind of a play of the spirituality atmosphere that Frank Roy Wright lays out for you at the museum because that's what he was thinking about the spiral. Um, but it's, again, a very cliche kind of uh, visualization of what spirituality is. Um, so that's him rolling. And then the third component of the project is him dropping a basketball from the ceiling of the museum with a drone, facilitated by a drone, um, to the center. I have a little bit. Can we play this? It's like a... Oh, okay. Sorry. It's really fast. It's 17 seconds. But we documented it when the museum was doing changeover, so no artwork, and it was middle of the night. Nobody was there. Um, great. And I'm just going to quickly go through Tao Fei, who is making, maybe you're more familiar with her work. So she's making a new film featuring the automation distribution center in China that is kind of the equivalent of Amazon. Um, this is her storyboard of the film. So there are three protagonists, the one fe female, one male, and a robot. And they're, you know, the only ones that are kind of walking in the factory. And then, you know, human replaces products, um, a very kind of dystopic imagination of the future. Then there is a part that almost serves as a fever dream that you return to revolutionary time, China, and all this collectiveness and people dancing in the factory, sort of the body re-emerges. We don't have time, but I have a clip. If you want to watch, we can watch it later. Last but not least is Samson Yang, who is making an installation, sound installation. Um, so he's interested in how computer modeling and computer engineer could recreate sound or invent sound. So he designed all these impossible instruments, either so huge, like a 20-foot trumpet, or tiny, like a one-inch long flute, that no human body can actually activate them. And he worked with a lab in University of Edinburgh to design the sound. So it's so convincing, as if it's from another civilization. But um, he's also interested in ideas of ritual and ceremony and how that we're losing these genuine interactions with them as many things are being replaced technologically. Um, so that's it. Well, come see the show. <laughs> Let's sit here all together. Uh, yeah, won't you? Okay. All right, uh, I'm gonna sit in the middle. I mean, okay, you're gonna sit here. Okay. <laughs> okay. So um, I apologize for this kind of marathon type of you know uh, uh, series, uh, but it's it's sort of kind of like globalized, like you know, mar like force of you know putting uh, that let us like do you know, like. 
you know, finish one job and implement another. Um, anyhow, so we have about 10 minutes to, to have a kind of conversation because it's important for me to, you to have a conversation. And um, uh, for it's quite interesting for me to, uh, to see how the relationship between local and global, how global for forces have, you know, formed the, the, the lives of local people and, and, and how artists like, interpret the work. I, that this applies both uh, your, your uh, curatorial project and one's work. And i like to hear about how, you know, just uh, comment through how you, how do you, what kind of connection do you find uh, through the one Jun Chez work and how you. Um, I think being having a really great conversation through the presentation, for me, I, what strikes me a lot is when you were telling me that growing up in South Korea, that the stories or everyday people, uh, people's everyday lives or understanding of North Korea is not so made accessible and uh, it's not like from the movie. Um, but that your, your approach actually is to um, create a relationship between your perspective on uh, uh, the relationship between Africa and North Korea and an historical kind of uh, take on that provides a different way of entering that reality and entering that history. For me, it's very interesting to think of how um, this is, you know, certain things are being made accessible through that kind of connection. Um, and for me, in terms of this whole negotiation between local and global has long been uh, a central kind of point for my thinking and work. Um, at one point, I think in the 90s, we were celebrating globalization and we were celebrating this suddenly increased uh, mobility of moving around. I went to see an exhibition of Harold Zeman um, at the Getty, which is sort of the father figure of all the independent curators. Uh, and there is an installation of his uh, accumulated uh, travel airplane tags that you put on your suitcase, no? And then apparently he kept all of them um, since the 60s and two before he passed out, I mean, passed, passed away. And there were these very yellowing uh, sticky tags and also there are like, you can see all the details. So you can tell from that how obsessed he was and how that was a fetish of, you know, traveling around and looking at different things. But then that kind of attitude is slowly uh, eaten, being eaten away and now we're entering a period that we really question why uh, we're presenting things that in a, in a global situation um, and also people's obsessive of local things. Uh, am I talking too much? <laughs>
for a long time. So, and Xiaoyu, of course, he's been, she's been here over 10 years. So it's kind of interesting for me to, we are the one who can actually like, you know, see a, a kind of perspective from the, from the point of outside, outsider and looking back into your, like China or Korea. Um, I have actually a second question for, for both of you. Oh, do you have any uh, 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 comment for Xiaoyu before? No. <laughs> I have actually, kind of, for me, it's very interesting to see, to see socialist, realistic style of painting or, or sculptures. For you, you show some of the like, images, like socialist, realist kind of type of painting. And one Jun Che's work, uh, you see, uh, you, you're able to see like sculptures that has like socialist realism. And, but socialist realism was, was invented in Soviet Union. And as you all know, we have World War I, World War II, and, um, and China and, and North Korea got influenced by this communism and, and adopted the idea of socialist realism that in, in terms of art. Uh, and, 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 and Won Jun-chan's work kind of more interesting that Africa countries like, adopted the, the, the model of, of socialist realism through North Korea and um, also, also, uh, also North Korea, uh, social realism has adopted in China and, tr and re-transformed into local lives and artists reinterpret that. And, and for me, it's interesting how do you, uh, as, as, as you as a chi uh, Chinese curator and living in China, how do you see this like, transition and, and, and especially Won Jun Che's, like specifically Won Jun Che's work? Uh, I think we should take uh, two yeah. Um, yeah. Mm, I'm not interested in social uh, realism uh, art and uh, North Korean they call the Juche art but the uh, uh, important thing is a uh, uh, relationship between Africa and North Korea uh, on my film and uh, uh, the realism the North Korean style I mean I don't I don't want to uh, say uh, realis the, the socialism uh, socialistic realism because it, North Korean called the Juche art. So Juche art is not so uh, related to, I mean, not, not related to African uh, society. And uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, people describe, I mean, criticize, uh, many people criticize North Korean uh, buildings and monuments uh, in Africa, but uh, I like them because it's beautiful. Yeah, and uh, yeah, it's I, I overwhelmed. Yeah, and uh, uh, the North Korean they never considered the African environment uh, before um, before they design. Uh, it's the same as the Western architects and designers uh, made the building or uh, public art in Korea in. Maybe I don't know other countries' uh, uh, story, but the many interest and bad story related to uh, being names. They when they built uh, public art and buildings in Korea, like a um, uh, design center in Seoul and uh, Laotian uh, uh snails. Yeah, so it's just, it's like a, uh, I mean it reminded me the Western artist uh, attitude when North Korea uh, looking at and looking into Africa. Yeah. Huh. Is it working now or it's not working at all? Does it work now? Okay. I guess this, this is not working for me. Um, I think for me, I, maybe I mentioned a little bit earlier, just to echo what you said, that our accept aesthetic experience is pretty much shaped by many different complex factors. Um, political power, um, or forms of propaganda, or visible forms of propaganda and invisible forms of propaganda. Commercial is pretty much a form of propaganda mm -hmm. as well. And also um, the power dynamics between economic, the rising power of economic or established power of economic. And I think um, our appreciation pretty much also in China uh, of classic modernist masterpieces 
have much to do with the market too. So it's not so black and white as which is a better form of aesthetic experience and which is not, and what is a kind of a better art and what is not a kind of a better art. And also, let's not forget the promotion of humanitarian ideas or humanism is also a very one-sided power struct structure. So these, I think, should all be put into consideration. Uh, again, I'm not trying to pick side and mm -hmm. say which has more moral values and which does not. But I think it, the history is much more um, complicated than, than, than that. Um, I think that could be great uh, last remark. Uh, since we have a, you know, a limited amount of time, but we can continue to have Q&A at the end of the conversation. Yes, Sujen. Yes, and we have a, uh, let's have a five minute break. There is a water and a snack the other side of the room, and you can also able to see Won Jun Chez and other artists' uh, video work there. But come back, uh, let's have a three minute break, <laughs> and, come, and come back, uh, please. Thank you. Thank you.